Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. It is really a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker this evening because she is not only a friend of mine, but also a most accomplished artist whom I have admired for many, many years when we saw each other tonight for the first time after uh, an absence. Uh, we were trying to remember how long it had been and how long we had known each other. And uh, we were talking about years and suddenly we both realized that possibly it's decades now. <laughs> so I don't want to give you any further um, clues uh, to anything on that, but I have known and followed and admired Marianne Loveland's work for a long time, and I have seen it grow. It is uh, spectacular. It is informative. I think you will all um, learn a great deal from it and enjoy seeing it. Um, she will be speaking about her work this evening. Uh, Marianne is a painter and an artist in many other areas as well. She received her BFA degree from Ohio State University in painting and her MFA from Cornell University in painting. Uh, Mary Ann has taught at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. She's taught at the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma, at Cornell University, and at the University of Cincinnati. She's also done many lectures and presentations. She's exhibited very, very widely. I first came to know Mary Ann's work um, in Robert Stefanotti's gallery in New York City when I was an art critic for Arts Magazine. And I think most of you recognize that name, Robert Stefanotti, and know that she was an exhibiting artist in his gallery. Uh, Robert will be back very shortly, be teaching here this summer and next fall, so um, pay attention. Um, this is one of his artists and also one of his dear friends. Um, she's uh, shown most recently at the Nicholas Rorick Museum um, in New York and has shown very widely in um, many places throughout the country um, and throughout the world. Uh, she's been in group exhibitions and her private collections include the Robertson Memorial Center, the Speed Museum of Art, the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum in Miami, Florida. Marianne is included in many publications that you can find if you are familiar with uh, Gregory Babcock's Super Realism book, for example. Her work is illustrated there with an article about her work. Um, many other um, publications. Uh, I won't take any more time because you don't need to hear from me. You do need to hear from Marianne because she has some marvelous things uh, to say to you. And marvelous painting to show you. There you go. Can someone turn down the lights so that uh, we can start in? I guess we have a time limitation here. Um, when I was a student in the university um, at Cornell, one of the things that I always loved when we had a visiting artist was the opportunity to see their work and to find out how they came up with their ideas. Um, so that's what I'm going to attempt to do this evening. If you have any questions as we go along, you might keep the question, maybe make a little notation or something like that, and then at the end, if we have enough time, I'd be happy to answer it. If we don't have time, then maybe if I see you in your studio, you can ask me later. I started with a painting that was from my master's exhibition. And at that time, I was showing um, regionally, joining shows and winning prizes. Um, I met two judges from one of the museums that I was showing at, and they asked me to submit some slides, or in those days they weren't slides. I mean, this was so long ago, the photographs in black and white, it was before color. <laughs> um, 
So we had b uh, black and white photographs. They submitted it to Krasner Gallery, and that's how I got my first gallery. So when I graduated, I went to New York City and I set up a studio in New York. This slide, we're going to make a big jump now. In New York City, I painted for about two years, and then I went to Cornell University, and I started teaching, and I was teaching color theory. And some of these paintings are from Cornell, and I just moved to the British Virgin Islands and opened up a gallery. That's what that little sign is at the bottom there. I was dealing with um, colors of equal intensity, so they were jumping around, and you would get the illusion of the figures moving. I'd made a, an amazing discovery for me at that time, which was that um, a man came in to sell an overhead projector at Cornell, and he explained to me that I could take any image and blow it up as large as I wanted on the wall, and he had um, a slide of mine, and he made a little transparency and blew it up. And I suddenly recognized, my God, imagine how many hours of drawing that I can save if I can project that image. And also I can figure out where I want the image on the canvas, I can move it around and see all of those things pretty quickly. So I started doing that and at that time I was introduced to John Clem Clark. I don't know if any of you know his paintings. Um, and John and I started exchanging ideas. And the funny thing is that when the day I met him on his easel, he had the same model he was using a photograph from a magazine, and it was the same model, who, it was Mia Farrell's sister, that I had on my easel at home. So we had a real affinity, and we did a lot of exchange of ideas. So at this point, I'd say that my work was kind of floating around. I don't feel that I had much of a personal imagery or my own voice so to speak. I was hunting. I was moving to oils. I had been using polyvinyl acetate, making my own polymer pigments, because in those days they didn't. A Bocour was visiting Ohio State University, where I was an undergraduate, and he said, oh, you need um, to have these in tubes, and he started making the first uh, polymer paints. But at that time I was making my own polymers, and then switched to oils. This was a big leap, and I feel at this point something happened. I found a voice, and it came from a dream. I had the dream that there were some figures just like this, and the funny thing is that you know how sometimes when you get an idea, the waters seem to part and everything falls into place? Well, a photographer stopped by my house. I was living in Tortola in the British Virgin Islands. I told him about my dream. Um, then there had been a rainstorm and I went outside and looked at this most glorious rainbow and underneath the rainbow were these people waving from a boat and so they came in and docked at my dock and they said may we use your shower and I'd met them before I mean they weren't strangers and I said sure and they started undressing and I said would you mind after you shower if I tied you up in ropes <laughs> <laughs> took your photograph. And they said, sure, we'll do it. And so Olaf, the photographer, ran home and got his camera, and I took or had the first photographs from people modeling for me. And that was concurrent with John Clem Clark doing the same thing. Malcolm Morley started doing his photorealism. And this was a whole kind of movement, but from different points of the globe. It was like something was in the air, and all these new things were coming about. If you've ever, I don't know if any of you, uh, show of hands, have ever done anything from photographs on canvases? You know how you get these wonderful beads of light that happen? They kind of give you details of uh, information about how light works as color. So it, for me, it was really amazing. These photographs that I did the paintings from were in black and white, but the paintings were in color. I have one color reproduction here to give you a feeling of what they were like. Now I find that often when you finally find a, a voice or an image, it's so tempting to stay with it. You know, it's safe. 